Uh, good morning. Welcome back to the second session of the morning. Uh, this session is on how people are using old metrics now. Uh, we have a couple of really good sessions from some researchers, some librarians, uh, uh, and we're going to tell us how they view old metrics and how they're using them. We're running a little bit late, so the way that we're going to run this session is uh, each speaker is going to have 13 minutes, and then we'll take two minutes for questions uh, within their 15-minute slot. And then we'll have five minutes at the end for questions, and we should be back on track for lunch, because I don't want to keep you beautiful people from, from lunch. Um, first up, we'll have Ross. He currently works within MIMAS, the UK National Data Center at the University of Manchester. He's the service manager for a number of core services, from the Web Knowledge Service for UK Education through to EU PMC+, Plus, ZTalk, and others. He's also responsible for digital library-related R&D services, and has had formal involvement with Dublin Core, OpenURL, standards developments, and many, many other initiatives. He's interested in ALMs since around 2006 through his work with Counter and UKSG. His hope is that we can remove some of the confusion surrounding this area, and maybe there's even some place for standardi standardization. Openness is also a good thing. So welcome, Ross. You didn't explain that I'm not Paul Needham. So. Oh, yeah, he's standing in for Paul Needham. <laughs> Well, I hope he's seriously ill, because he only informed me yesterday. So. All right. Screen share. I'm OK. Great. Thank you. Right, as I say, I'm not Paul Needham. Um, basically, you could uh, squash this entire presentation into do people actually use the stuff that's in the institutional repositories in the UK? And the answer is yes. Okay. But it does raise a load more issues about well, what do you mean by yes and how does it compare with others. So uh, we'll, we'll just unpick it. Uh, if we go into the next, it's a partnership uh, project. There are um, a number of people involved uh, playing to their strengths. So um, the partnership is between uh, Mimus, uh, and that, that's me, I'm the service manager for this, and we host it. Cranfield University, that's where Paul Needham comes from, who's a developer. And then we involved uh, evidence base at various times to do specialist evaluation work. Um, although there are lots of names there, this whole thing equates to about one FTE. Okay. Uh, JISC uh, coordinated as part of a, a suite of services that some of you may recognize from that diagram that's over on the, on the right hand side. Uh, basically, there's the same team as JUSP, if any of you have heard of that, the General Usage Stats Portal. Um, some of the other JISC uh, constituents are REOX and Sherpa, things like that, okay? We'll move into this, the background. Uh, we did a project called Pyrus uh, a while back to look as if it's technically or feasibly possible to collate together article um, level usage statistics irrespective of where the article itself uh, resided. The answer was yes. Um, we then took it forward. Uh, People say we, we took the P out of it. We did. The P stood for publisher, um, and there were some business drivers, really, before, um, before they could be involved. So we took it forward purely focusing on institutional repositories, because that, that scoped it better for us. And it seems as if there was a case to do something useful. So uh, that's where we went from Iris. Um, the take-up, we, we were asked to transition it into service in 2012. So there's a graph here. Um, it's about halfway through. It starts with 2012. There's been a, a fair old take-up. It's used by about 65 of the institutions, which is about 50% of those technically able to participate. Um, it exposes usage stats on all item types, so it's not just articles. Okay. Uh, if I run through what data we actually gather, um, this has been covered, and you can you can. Uh, if you follow the stuff. It's all openly available on the website if you want to know what's involved in the tracker protocol. I'm not going to go through that. There's a time. But basically, we push minimal amount of metadata out from every institutional repository to a central, uh, you could think of it being a clearinghouse. We get a, a little tiny packet of data that, in, uh, that uh, indicates there's been a downlog of a particular item in an institutional repository. And then we, we process that <clears throat> and collate it together and, and get a profile of use on a daily basis. And then we refactor it on, on a monthly basis. So it's on a, a push model versus a pull model. Uh, some of the uh, places in Europe have gone for a pull model where they harvest information, but it puts the onus on um, institutional repositories to, to process the stats themselves, and that's a blocker. 
So ours is minimal, it's very lightweight, it works for ePrints, DSpace, and there's a specification for uh, Fedora. Uh, we've also gone out uh, and OAPN use it for ebooks in Arno software, and we've demonstrated it for Core. Core is an, uh, an aggregator. <coughs> so it's not necessarily limited, and it's a very simple protocol, deliberately. Uh, in terms of the processing, um, again, very lightweight, um, but I guess the, the thing I'd want to draw your attention to is that we're doing it according to counter code of practice for e-resources and articles, so we're compliant. Uh, irrespective of where it comes from, it's the same treatment when we're, when we're doing the processing. Now, one of the things in counter is a, a, robots, a list of robots that are specified to be excluded. Uh, but that's a minimal requirement, so we want to take it further because we're able to look at um, the patterns of usage across time as well. So um, we took a bit of work forward to look at robots and other types of dubious usage, non-human non usage, and um, developed some algorithms that are going forward under counter as a robots working group uh, and also through the consortium of open access repositories in, in Europe. Um, Oh, the one thing I meant to mention that the, we haven't just made all this up. This builds on um, the same mechanism that was used uh, in the Measure project, which some of you may did, um, that was then taken forward in the European Knowledge Exchange workshops. So it does have some history. In terms of exposing it, uh, there's a, a website, and if I get a chance, although I doubt I will, I can show you to the end, it's live data. Uh, but we also make it available in a wide variety of formats, including this, it has its own sushi server. Uh, as part of the counter work, we're also going forward with uh, a sushi light version, which will um, remove some of that XML bloat that uh, you get uh, if you're trying to describe all the articles. Uh, there's a screenshot of the, uh, the main picture, the, the main website. Basically, it's just a load of numbers in spreadsheets, and then when you go through, those numbers have been added together in interesting ways uh, in response to what our user community wants. But I'll, I'll maybe highlight some of those things. Right. Um, the, we asked our community, because uh, this is sort of an emerging market, what, what is it that uh, you find valuable? What, what, what is it you want to do with it? Um, and the, the things that they, they valued were the fact that there was a standard that they could point to, um, but uh, we were filtering, and they were able to just download stats in a, in a composite unit that's been produced for them and then pass them on, so they didn't have to manually process the data themselves. Saving time, so uh, there are a number of numbers on there that uh, quantify it. And where we asked them how could you actually apply this data? Where, where are you interested in going? Um, they were uh, interested in us acting on their behalf, again, saving time. They, they don't have to all can, uh, to comply to various standards and uh, guidelines, codes of practice, etc., that have been asked of them. Um, and then in the user survey down at the bottom, what is it that's it's, it's changed for you? Well, improved statistical reporting and saving time. They're the easy ones. But then also it enables things that they were unable to do before. So it's, it's put in place an enabling technology. And what kind of things they hope to do with it, 83%, they want to benchmark them against other people. That's yeah. common. <laughs> How am I doing for time? Did I get it? You have seven minutes and 53 seconds. Right. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right. Uh, there's some contact points there. But if I, if I nip out. Yeah, right. So this is the live homepage. Um, that shows the growth. Um, there are a load of views of the data across here. The aggregate stats, we've got, um, uh, since we started, there are now 67 repositories in it. Uh, we've seen downloads of almost 270,000 discrete items in those repositories. And since we started counting, there have been over 20 million download events. Uh, but if you just look at the last month, there have been uh, around a million downloads, um, and that also accounts for uh, robot usage and stuff. Um, this is live data, so uh, those are the institutional repositories that are in it. 
those are the numbers of interest to them and to the aggregates. We can some of them summarize by country, uh, the platforms that are used, also the item types. So uh, no surprise that the article is the most popular. Um, just looking at the number of uh, downloads this month, which is the third, the uh, can you see article or is this blurred? Okay. The, the one, the one that's uh, second most to the top is article, as you can see, it goes into six figures. But um, it's it's round about three hundred thousand last month. But if you just look down into theses and dissertation, that's a similar number. So people are using the theses and dissertation to the same extent as they're downloading journal articles from the institutional repositories. And there are similar other surprisingly large and sustained usage events associated with other item types, so book sections, uh, conference papers, exam papers, things like that. I just meant, I mentioned robots. This uh, gives an idea, if you can see it, of um, first column is the amount of raw data that comes in. The second column is the amount of data, uh, the usage data that is discarded because it falls foul of the count of robots rule. The next one are things that we exclude as part of IRIS. So that's where uh, we recognize there's been some dubious activity, uh, either through known um, uh, robots, uh, other malicious activity, or suspicious. And then double clicks. So you're left over on, on the right hand side with a uh, filtered data out. Three minutes. Okay. Right. Uh, we also, although we're not the DOI police, we can report on the presence of DOIs in the repositories, and they're not just uh, used for articles, although that's the most prevalent, they're also used on things like conference items, and etc. So we, we can report on the number of DOIs and turn that into a percentage, so of the items that were downloaded, how many of those could we find uh, a DOI for it. Um, and we can supply back to the repositories a list of their articles with the DOIs and the percentage. So there's a, a role we could play in helping them improve the quality. So this isn't telling people off. So for example, um, in uh, Imperial College, 96.1% of their articles have findable DOIs, which is a, a commendable score. Uh, down here, I won't call any of these up, but th these are where we get specific, we could then go down to the item level and we produce out uh, item level stats and count them. Uh, across month and get various profiles. Uh, and we can uh, produce reports separately on these these e theses and dissertations uh, as a separate counter style report. Um, we can consolidate it, although quite what you do with one spreadsheet that had a list of all the usage events across all the repositories, uh, I, d I don't know. Uh, one of those things that's too big to actually do anything useful with, in my opinion. Um, we do issue out Cases where um, duplicate DOIs have been used. Uh, I don't know if this will be thrown up, but uh, yeah. So again, we can we can say that um, the DOIs you used here, you, they may or may not uh, be pointing at the, the correct object or not. Quality. That's the kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Questions. Okay, yeah. So, any questions? Yeah. Martin here. Um, can you talk a bit more about the DOI? So is it that the other things in there just don't have a DOI because they are, let's say, gray literature? Or is it that it's difficult for repositories to attach DOIs or they just don't believe it? Uh, all three. Um, <laughs> there isn't an easy mechanism necessarily for them to incorporate the DOI if it was something like a preprint, for example. Uh, and it could be that. Post, uh, depending on how the article gets deposited in the institutional repository, there may or may not be the opportunity for a DOI to be included in that in that data flow, which is why there are so many possibilities for metadata enhancement when you're doing things on a national basis, looking across the piece, because then we could supply back a file that someone could choose to upload, to ingest against, because we've got the identifiers within their repository for the, each of those article references, so you could include them. Similarly, if you had some kind of reference, such as, I don't know, an ISSN or a DOI at a journal level, again, that could be fed back to institutions should they wish to do so, so, so they could enhance their metadata. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right, we, we have time for one more question, if anyone has a question. Yeah. We would love to. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Please? Oh, yes, the question was, can we put the P back, because it's silent at the moment. Yes, yes, we would like to. I mean, all the people who were in Paris originally are basically all the people who participated in the journal usage factor uh, project. So that there are, yeah, it, it just they have to devote time to, to converse with us, but it would be nice to, to be able to include the publisher side. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So uh, next up we have Lisa. Is Lisa here? Great, fantastic. Next up we have Lisa. Lisa is the director of research metrics at Elsevier. A key part of her role is interaction with the researcher community to learn about the needs and most effectively uh, effective ways of addressing those needs. She's also responsible for ensuring that what we learn about research metrics is implemented in the most useful possible way across all of Elsevier's products. Uh, she got interested in ALMs uh, when the Snowball, Snowball Metrics group decided that they would like to endorse all metrics as a key research metric. For her, it's most important that the research community feels confident in using these range of metrics that are out there. So a key part is communication around that. And it's also important to communicate that we're not saying that they replace any of the existing traditional ways of looking at research but rather that they add to those as uh, alternative options. So I'll just get your presentation thank you. up for you. Uh, oh, thank you. Like this. Glad you're doing this. Uh, there we go. OK, so. Uh, oh, tiny. Um, tiny screen on here. Yeah, so you'll have 13 minutes until All right. questions. Right. Ready, steady, go. Thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, so what I'm going to do in the next uh, 12 minutes and 50 seconds or so is give you the snowball metrics perspective on how altmetrics can be used. Um, although I'd dearly like to think that every single person in this room already knows about the snowball metrics project. I'll assume there's a couple that don't. So I'm just going to spend the first few minutes by giving you a brief uh, tour through what snowball metrics is. Oh, interesting. No. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to use some defective slides. Must be the transfer from a PC to a Mac. Okay. So the, the vision of Snowball Metrics is that a, a set of metrics is um, agreed by universities that enable benchmarking. That benchmarking drives quality and efficiency in higher education institutions. And um, all of those metrics that are, are agreed by the universities are done independently of the uh, data sources and the systems and so on that the um, universities have in place. So what should be underneath um, is uh, a set of the uh, key uh, characteristics of the Snowball Metrics Initiative. So let's see if I can remember uh, what was there. The key Snowball Metrics and um, it's really the one thing for you to take away with you today if there's only one thing that you remember is that it's a university-driven initiative. Okay, sometimes we hear you know, Elsevier is involved, so it's an Elsevier initiative. It's not. That's incorrect. It's a university-driven initiative. Um, it started in the UK with a group of eight universities, including Oxford and Cambridge. I'm really pleased to see Jürgen and Eugenio sitting there, so maybe they want to comment uh, at the end. Um, but there's also now a group in the US. There's strong interest from Japan and from a group of um, Asian Pacific Rim universities as well. So it's really becoming a, a global initiative. Um, started small, the idea was that it would snowball up. That is what seems to be happening. Um, what else is important about snowball metrics? I mentioned that um, the, the metrics that are agreed must not depend on any one particular data source or any one particular supplier. Um, because it's university driven, the universities use any data source that they have available to them. It might be data that the universities have um, inside, inside the university, data about applications, it could be uh, data about um, people from the HR systems. It could draw on commercial data, such as data that's available from Elsevier or Thomson or whoever else. Um, and it could also draw on third party data, such as the data that is available from our funders or from the Higher Education Statistics Agency or whatever. So any of those types of uh, data are up for grabs in the definition of snowball metrics. Um, 
at the bottom of the screen you can see these, um, these logos and what this is reminding me to say is that it's one of the principles of Snowball not to reinvent the wheel. Nobody wants to do work that, that doesn't need to be done. Right? So if there are very good existing standards that make sense to the universities, um, they will reuse them. Maybe they'll reuse them as they are, maybe they'll um, adapt them a little bit, um, but whatever, they'll be, they'll be reused if they can be. Um, and here you see some of the uh, standards that are being reused. There's uh, Eurocris and CASRI data format standards, Higher Education Statistics Agency, and the uh, National Science Foundation in the US. Um, so it's really building on what's already there, but from a university perspective. All right, let me see what surprises await on the next slide. Oh, this one looks okay. All right, so the output of Snowball Metrics is this. Um, it's the recipe book, the Snowball Metrics recipe book, and there are copies of this in the in the coffee room. So I'd encourage you to to grab a copy if you haven't already. Um, and if they're very popular and they've run out, you can download it from their web. It's free. Um, what's in here is you, know, you might you might get a clue from the name. A set of recipes. They're really just methods about how to calculate these metrics that this group of universities have said would be useful for them to benchmark, to give input to their institutional strategies. That's it. Um, also on the website, there's a statement of intent, which is signed by all of the, uh, the initiating universities at eight in the UK, and Elsevier as well as a project partner. And that says that these recipes are free. They'll always be free forevermore. Nobody is ever going to charge for them. So everybody signed up to that. So um, the, the output is a set of methods that are free. And they can be used by anybody for their own purposes. Right. <clears throat> so I'm emphasizing this is a university-driven initiative. And yet I'm here from Elsevier standing here talking to you about snowball metrics. So what am I doing? I just thought it was worth going through the, uh, the roles and responsibilities of the players in this, um, in this project. So what the universities are doing is... Um, Quite nice. I heard a couple of them say, we're controlling our own destinies. Um, they're getting a little bit tired of um, ways of them being measured, being imposed on them from above, and they've decided to, to take control and think for themselves about what they want. The, university the universities are deciding which metrics it is that they want to endorse as snowball metrics. They are deciding which types of data they want to use. They're deciding how to combine those data together to make these metrics that everybody regardless of the systems and the data sources that they have in their own universities, that everybody can understand in the same way, calculate the same metrics from, so that if they uh, exchange the metrics and benchmark with each other, they can be sure that they're comparing apples with apples. That's what the universities are doing. What is Elsevier doing? Elsevier is uh, project managing this. Um, it was great to be asked by the, the group of universities to, to support in this way, and really a support role is, is what um, Elsevier is doing. It's supporting and often pushing, because I think it's probably not a, a surprise to anybody here that sometimes the academic world goes a bit slowly. So uh, that's a lot of my role is, is pushing as well to make sure that things keep moving. Um, but that's a large part of what Elsevier is doing here. Um, it's also key for the universities that the the recipes that are published in the recipe book aren't some kind of fantasy, not some kind of fantasy about what you can measure. Um, it's not the idea to say, oh, we measure impact in this way, but then not actually know whether it's doable. So all the recipes in the book are tested on real data to make sure that they are feasible. And that is another role that Elsevier uh, plays in this project. We have a lot of um, skills in working with data and with generating metrics. And we put those skills at the, de at the deposit of these universities um, so that they can test whether what they think is feasible really <coughs> is feasible. I think the other thing to call out from this slide is that no money is changing hands. Again, I suppose because we're Elsevier, people often think, oh, you're paying these universities to be involved. Otherwise, why would they be sitting in a room with you? It's not true. No money is changing hands. We're not paying universities to be involved. There's a bit of cost involved, usually travel to meetings, but everybody is covering those costs themselves. <clears throat> All right, so that's the background. Now I'll get on to the old metrics a bit. So um, what the Snowball Metrics Initiative wants to do is to have uh, metrics defined, tested, and shared in recipe books so that everybody can use them 
in all of these different areas across um, what they call the, the snowball metrics landscape or the, the metrics landscape, whatever. I won't go through all of this, but I've put um, a circle around this um, area called esteem measure, socioeconomic impact, and the um, altmetric recipe. Three minutes, it says, uh, wow, we've got stuff five on here. Okay, the altmetric recipe um, uh, sits in that bucket. Um, this is an example of one of the flavors of an altmetric according to the snowball recipe. This is a recipe called scholarly activity. Um, and you can see the top left here, um, some total counts for institutions, and then there's total counts normalized by size of the university in a couple of different ways, by uh, FTEs, number of researchers, and by number of outputs that those um, altmetric counts are distributed over. That just shows you how each kind of sub-recipe is set up. But the altmetric recipe that you can see in the recipe book actually has four flavors. A scholarly activity, which is a number of poster scholarly tools, such as Mendeley and Zotero. There's scholarly commentary, I think it's self-explanatory. Social activity, which is about Facebook posts and tweets. And mass media, which is uh, counts of comments in newspapers and so on. So they're the four flavors of the snowball metrics altmetric. Right, so now we get on to the, the whole point of this presentation, I think, is what I was asked to talk about, having gone through all of that. Why is Snowball Metrics, why are these universities interested in alt metrics? Um, in all honesty, I have to say that when this came up in a meeting last year, when I heard that they wanted to look at alt metrics, I was pretty surprised because um, the universities involved are, uh, no offence, quite, quite traditional universities, and this is an extremely new and innovative field, but no, they were very certain that they wanted to. So why is that? Um, first of all, they were very, very keen to look at uh, the measure of engagement with their output within the scholarly community more widely. Of course, citations is one way of looking at that, but altmetrics is, is another way, is a complementary way. So that was one reason. But the really critical reason, the one that comes up again and again and again in the meetings, is trying to get a handle on how a university's output is, um, is viewed, is picked up, is talked about outside the scholarly sphere how it's talked about by the public. And there are a couple of those um, metric flavors on the previous slide, the social activity in mass media, which um, can be contributed to by members of the general public. And that's fantastically interesting to, uh, to the universities, of course. There's a couple of other points here, and I am quoting liberally from a great article that uh, Jürgen published recently. Um, so uh, you'll have to correct me if I misrepresent you, but I don't think so. Um, the the first comment from Jürgen is saying that um, altmetrics offer a great chance to bring STEM disciplines and the non-STEM non disciplines together. It's no secret to anybody here that the arts and humanities are kind of left behind in this whole discussion about how to measure performance, how to evaluate it, or how to uh, show off about how great you are. Um, and altmetrics is seen as one way of combining those together. And then last, I'm standing up, but just let me go to the last point. Um, the, the last point that uh, I would draw from Jürgen's paper is, is that he says that altmetrics alone in their current form cannot be used to judge the quality of research output. And I think there you meant that the data sources were not great. And actually go further. No matter how good the data sources are, altmetrics alone will not be good enough to judge scholarly output quality. Um, what's interesting about them, what's useful about them, is that they're, they're part of the set of metrics. They're part of the range of metrics that you have in that metrics landscape which altogether allows a university in this case, but it could also be a researcher or a funder or whatever, the most complete picture possible of how their output is, is doing and how impactful they're being on the, the world of research and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, does anybody have a question? I have a question. Um, so they started talking about this last year mm -hmm. and have started investigating uh, yeah. Have there been any specific examples of where an implementation of that has been used in the university context since they started talking about that? And if you could repeat the question, that would be great. Yeah. Um, the question is basically, are there any examples of this being used in the university context? It's nice to talk about how it could be used, but are there examples of it being used? Um, what I can tell you is that we did, um, we did create examples of these altmetric flavors um, from real data um, so that the universities could see if it made sense. Um, whether they have actually used them is something I don't know. That's up to that's up to the universities. But I'm looking at Eugenio and Jürgen if you want to uh, comment. 
<laughs> okay, Jürgen confirms that Cambridge have, have used the data in the comparison. Great. Um, the question is, do I think that in the next few years, funding agencies, in particular funding agencies, right, will be using this kind of data to quantitatively assess the impact of research output? Um, my answer is that I sincerely hope so. I really hope so. I think, I think that this is a part of the uh, puzzle, a part of the complete picture um, of, of understanding research impact. It's certainly not the only part. It doesn't matter how good or how complete this metrics part gets, it should never, ever, ever replace um, all of the input from peer review and, and from expert opinions and from impact studies. But I think that if it's not there alongside all of those things, then we're really missing a trick. Um, so it, need, it needs to be there as part of the, of the complete approach, yeah. So I hope so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, uh, I guess we're going to just... Sorry, this is why we need a bit of extra time. Yeah. If you can figure that out, I'll just choose the next speaker. Okay, so in a moment, uh, we will have uh, Mike Thule, who is Professor of Informatics, Information Science at the University of Wolverhampton. He develops and evaluates new web-based ALMs and is trying to exploit new and existing ALMs to research the process of outcomes of scholarly communication. He became interested in ALMs in about 2005, 2006, when a PhD student, Kayan Kosha, had the idea to use commercial search engines to develop web-based impact metrics for academic articles. He keeps bumping into people who say that there are no evaluations of altimetrics out there, but there are loads. And so he'd like to see a greater awareness of those valuations and the evaluations that have gone on so far. Uh, and we will have his slides up. Yeah, we will get this, sorry. In a moment. Uh, let's try it. Uh, if you just hit it from there. This one? Yeah. Is that it? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm going to try and give a presentation from the um, academic uh, researcher perspective, from the perspective of the people that research into altmetrics, so not the researchers as users of altmetrics but the researchers as the community of people, small community of people, that look, and look at altmetrics and conduct experiments or conduct various types of research to see whether um, there is value in uh, an altmetric or not. Okay, so, I'm, so I research altmetrics as, as part of my job. I teach altmetrics, I teach um, cybermetrics, as we call it, at the University of Wolverhampton to undergraduates and postgraduates, write books about it, um, publish journal articles about it. So a traditional researcher's perspective where the object of my study is uh, altmetrics and other, type of other types of metrics. So, uh, um, so I'm going to try and use this presentation to summarize the key academic evidence, empirical evidence, for the value of altmetrics. So I'm going to just summarize the the, um, the results of studies, and I'm a person that absolutely loves statistics, but I've stopped myself from telling you almost anything at all about statistics. But if we get to the end and you want to ask a question about statistics, then please do. Everyone else in the audience <laughs> will thank you for it. 
Okay, so essentially the problem that all of the studies I'm going to talk about are interested in is um, do altmetrics have value in the sense that are they completely random or do they reflect some type of impact or do they reflect something else? Um, so there's, from the random perspective, um, people sometimes say, well, this is a really awful article that's got a really high altmetric score, um, so therefore altmetrics are useless. And on the other hand, you might have someone who says, well, um, your tweets reflect the social impact that your research is having. So if you don't have a high number of tweets, then you're not doing research with a social impact. So, we want, so I'm going to summarize studies which look at the evidence to say that uh, various different altmetrics are random or they're not random. So how do we do this? Well, the dominant approach um, for reasons primarily of um, practicality, I guess, the dominant approach is to see whether the scores you get from altmetrics correlate or associate or relate to citation counts for the same set of articles. So essentially all the studies I'm going to talk about have taken a large set of articles and then looked at the citation counts for those articles and then compared them to the altmetric scores from various different altmetric sources. So you might think, well, uh, what's the point of that? Because we want to replace citations with um, altmetrics. Well, um, citations have been heavily researched over the past three decades now, so there's a lot of empirical evidence and qualitative evidence about what citations measure. So there are kind of a known quantity. So if we know how each altmetric relates to citations, then we um, get some of it, so we get the relationship between an unknown altmetric and a known citations. And then we're much further forward in understanding what altmetrics actually reflect. So it's a little bit of a a paradox in a sense because we want we know altmetrics will not be the same as citations but the first way to assess what they reflect is to actually compare them to citations it's a little bit strange okay so um, typically when we do a study the most of the studies pick articles from a single year a single document type and a single discipline so if you compare articles from different years then it's apples and oranges, there's no, there's no point. Um, so an old article will have lots of citations maybe, but won't have been tweeted because more recent articles get tweeted. So just from a, from a, a validity point of view, we need to pick articles from the same year, um, also from the same field, because uh, a, mathemat a mathematics article that gets 10 citations is phenomenal, whereas uh, a cancer article with 10 citations is irrelevant. So there are huge field differences between citations. Um, so it really does matter. And if you're a humanities scholar, you probably don't care about citations anyway. You just want to know um, who published your book. So it really, you really have to restrict your attention to one field to get the, uh, the best data. Okay, so most of these studies look at one year and one field, or at least split the um, data set they've got into different fields. Okay, so to em emphasize the point, we're going to check, we're going to try and show that altmetrics are not random by showing that they correlate with um, citations. We um, can show that altmetrics relate to scholarly communication because we know that citations are part of scholarly communication. So if we correlate altmetrics and citations, we know that altmetrics have some kind of relationship to scholarly communication and we have evidence from the actual correlation score of how close each altmetric is to um, uh, citation type scholarly communication. Okay, so I'm going to go through a few different altmetrics and just try and summarize the empirical evidence. So first of all, Mendeley so Mendeley, if you pick articles from a single year in a single field, you typically get a, a significantly positive, a moderate or strong correlation between citations and the number of Mendeley readers. So Mendeley is really citation-like behavior. So it's, quite, it's not the same as citations, um, but the, the correlations are um, 
all the tests for, for, for journal articles, all the tests I've seen have been significant and positive. So there is hard empirical evidence that Mendeley Alt metrics for journal articles um, correlate with citations and therefore they're not random. They're, they reflect some kind of scholarly impact. So I'm not going to go through all these studies, but these, uh, these uh, studies um, summarize the, the fields and the types of data that's been tested. Okay, so the correlation is higher in science, lower in the social science and the humanities. So it depends by broad discipline, uh, the extent of the correlation. So good news for Mendeley. <laughs> so Twitter, so Twitter is a much more difficult case. So Twitter was the first um, optometric I thought was really promising as a source of societal impact. Um, but the correlations are much lower with Twitter. And in fact, if you do a test in the way I've described it, you'll get a correlation of zero or even negative. Um, and um, so Twitter doesn't work with uh, the standard types of statistical tests that we do. And the reason is because the uptake of Twitter is still rapidly increasing and its scholarly use is still rapidly increasing and particularly being driven by publishers. So if you're reading an article in Nature, it's it's a button click to tweet that article to your followers. So it's, it's no effort at all because Nature has put uh, tweet to this article button on the page while you're reading it. They put the title of the article in or a summary of the article. They put the link in. So you literally have to um, just click the button as long as you're logged into Twitter on that computer and you send your tweet. So the amount of tweet is really increasing a lot. So if you pick a typical article, from, from that was published in the last week, it might have a lot of tweets, and of course it won't be cited yet because it's just been published. Whereas if you pick an article from many years ago, it probably wasn't tweeted because people tend to tweet the latest research. It might have been tweeted, but uh, people do tend to tweet the latest research. So it might have a lot of citations and no um, tweets. And even in the same year, you, you find that the more recent articles are much more tweeted than uh, the older articles in the same year and less cited. So um, the correlation tests don't work for Twitter, but we have we developed an alternative statistical test. Please ask me about it afterwards. I think they'd be very happy. That shows that despite that, um, the more tweeted articles do tend to be more cited. So essentially, if you look at a set of articles published in the same issue of a journal, then the articles today that have been more tweeted tomorrow will probably be more cited. So that's more or less what the, the test does. But the, the correlation isn't strong for Twitter. The, yeah, but it, it's definitely there. Um, so other alt metrics. Um, so for other things, these are all altmetric.com data. So thank you, Ewan. I haven't met him yet, but thank you for your data. Um, so for altmetric.com data, it was less uh, common than uh, for, there are less uh, articles with a non-zero metric count for all the other data sources. <coughs> Thank you. But um, there was a statistically significant positive correlation for all of these other sources. Okay, all the other types of alt metrics. So for all the ones we've tested for which there's enough data, the results are positive. If you get any kind of alt metric score, um, of the ones that we've tested so far, um, then it is likely to associate with more citations. That's a statistical <coughs> likelihood, not like a guarantee. Um, so another interesting one is uh, F1000. Um, so F1000 uh, for medical biochemical research, and their scores also associate with uh, citations. And F1000 is interesting because you can, um, uh, it also tells you the type of um, article you're reading. So they give a tag for the article, not just a score for the article, but you get a tag for, for the article, for the t uh, type of article it is. So, uh, yeah. that's interesting. so that's good news. Um, so in addition to this, in addition to the traditional type alt metrics, so there are other metrics that you can derive for articles and books. 
Um, so in my group, we've kind of, well, specialized, particularly Kevin Kusha, in um, metrics that you can gather, you can create from the web. So we typically use APIs or just search engine searches to generate these metrics. Um, so these are other article level metrics that uh, also correlate. Some of them are particularly useful for books. So books don't tend to score well on traditional alt metrics, but if you use, uh, there are some Google book search and Amazon.com metrics that you can use for, to assess book impact to some extent. So, so maybe we should call these Kusha metrics. So, um, Generally, the evidence is that alt metrics do correlate with citation. So, if someone says, "Well, I've got an example of an article with a high alt metric score and it's rubbish or it's got no citations," then you can say, "Well, overall, what you're saying is true, I'm sure, but overall, there is a tendency for articles that have higher alt metric scores to also be more cited." And um, so. And we know that articles that are more cited, also in general, in general, with many exceptions, tend to be the better articles. So in general. So citation counts correlate with peer review in most subject areas, in general, with many exceptions. Um, so this is the evidence that alt metrics do have value for scholars. And although there are exceptions, um, in general, um, they are useful. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Sorry, that was a bit awkward. Cameron, and if you could repeat the question. Yes. So I'm increasingly bothered by the fact that we keep coming back to this thing that does this correlate with that. You made a point about Twitter and uptake is rising and that complicates everything. Um, is it not the case that we should be, we should focus? Maybe this is more. Maybe this is the kind of analysis you're doing. On a signal processing paradigm, we're asking the question: How does this event, this tweet, likely to be related to a downstream Mendeley bookmark, which is likely to be related to a downstream citation, or to other things? I mean, many pathways seem to follow. It seems like we keep forgetting that the time domain is critically important, and we keep taking a frequentist approach when actually, kind of, it feels like basic approach. So please repeat the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the question is, um, essentially, have should studies not ex ignore the time factor when analysing uh, the data? So th there's one study so far, which um, which is the Eisenbach study, um, which looked at the tweets of one particular journal, um, Journal of Medical Informatics, in one year. And it counted all the tweets to articles in that year, and then it counted citations from the next year. So that was definitely tweets first, citations second. And he did find um, a positive correlation between the two. So he was able to conclude that if you look at this year's tweets, you can use them to, to predict, to some extent, next year's citations. Um, it's just much harder to do that kind of study. So yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm halfway through collecting data for that study with Mendeley, if I can Mendeley again. Um, but but uh, to see if that's also true for Mendeley, but for most of the for most uh, study types, that takes a lot more data collection, a, long, a lot longer period of time to get the answer. But you are yeah, definitely we need to do that. Great, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you. You can follow. Now. <laughs> okay. Um, Last up in this session, we have Joan Wee, who came all the way from Singapore to give her talk. Uh, she was sponsored by Springer to come over to give this talk. Joan Wee is a new media librarian with Banyan Technological University in Singapore. As part of her portfolio, she tracks emerging technologies and trends, which are relevant in the higher education landscape, and she provides consultation and training to researchers and faculty about those emerging tools. Social media mentions and engagement are part of that alternative metrics area, which are very relevant to our work. She's interested to see how researchers who don't benefit from traditional citations could benefit from these kinds of metrics, and she's very interested in seeing what the latest trends are at this conference and meeting all of you lovely people. So I'll hand over to Joan now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Okay, so hello, everyone. Um, 
Thank you, Yen. Thank you, Springer, for sponsoring me. Um, my name is Joan. I'm a new media librarian with Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, NTU for short. So I'm very happy to be here today to um, share what we have done in uh, NTU. Um, I actually have a dual role in NTU, so other than a new media librarian, I'm also a social sciences librarian. So I have helped my faculty with compilation of citation counts. That's a part of an academic librarian job. And usually it's kind of stressful because they always complain about the citation count not reflecting very well for their input. So we thought that use of alternative metrics is a very good uh, source that maybe somewhat will complement um, the traditional citations for them. So that's why um, me and my um, colleague, my boss actually, talked about one thing. We did some studies, so I presented the study, which is called All Metrics is an Indication <laughs> of Quality um, Research or Just Hot Topics Early June in I2. Uh, conference, so we think all metrics is attractive because it draws a lot of data from a variety of sources, and for especially for humanities and social science researchers, it could imply greater visibility of their research in other areas that is not captured by the traditional citations. So um, I might skip some of the slides because this presentation is the same presentation as the I took. So um, Print shared this table that um, best summarize how the different researchers' output are being shared with um, researchers and with non-researchers, which is public. For example, researcher A can share a research output with another via Faculty 1000, or his works can be uh, publicized via popular press, like in magazines or newspapers, because, uh, for example, I have a econs faculty that actually get interviewed regularly to talk about pollution's impact on the economy because like we have taste issues in Indonesia and Singapore and Malaysia but these kind of things um, does impact the society but won't be captured in citation, the traditional citation counts. Um, so of course I will skip the tools part, I will skip some of the presentation slide. So what is all metrics for us? So our studies aimed to find out if the top most cited articles in Web of Science across broader categories of discipline were to enjoy high on metric score, like what Tal Ward has been doing. I will be quoting some of his works here as well. Um, and to find out if all metrics measure popular research topics rather than heavy research. So what did we do? Um, okay, this is, uh, Okay, so this paper, um, this is what we do. The yeah, we, we look at the different categories. We top twenty with highest or metric so, um, scoring. Okay, so, so. okay, top twenty articles with highest or metric score have Web of Science citation for the same eighteen broad categories. So we just look at the top twenty articles and the top twenty most cited articles which is not very research-based, but I'm a librarian, I'm not a researcher, so I just want to come up with something that we think is relevant to our researcher or something that I, we could sell to the management to get them to um, use our metrics. So this is my data and methodology and uh, 18 subject categories that we have looked at. And Here's uh, our results. So uh, this, this graph actually marks um, this axis is the likelihood that an article appears on uh, cited that has a high or metric score is cited in Web of Science, and the x axis is likelihood that a highly cited article in Web of Science has an or metric scoring. So we notice there's a of course there's a um, more benefits for subjects like medicine, biological, psychology, and sociology, which is in the higher quadrant there. Um, but for other 13 subjects, the correlation is low. But then the presence of the coexistence, meaning they, appear, they have a citation count and an all count, doesn't really mean that a heavily cited 
paper is necessarily well mentioned in social media. So we took this further and we used a person correlation to try to find out how positively correlated the two matrices are. Uh, so, yep. Uh, this is what we did. So I highlighted those with higher person uh, correlation. This um, study is important for us because when we sell it to the different schools or to the research office, this will be the common questions they will ask about how um, it benefits certain subject areas but might not be uh, so well used in other subject areas. Okay. Uh, so we took one of the examples that has a um, very high uh, a metric score of 821 for the burden of disease and the changing task of medicine. And we checked the citation. The citation is only cited 20 times in Web of Science. So the presence of coexistence does not imply that a hot topic is also well cited. So this is what actually we wanted to see. Yeah, so we did a little bit more studies and noticed that actually uh, why is this so high on metric score? It's because a lot of people is actually quoting this table inside the, the research. But it doesn't mean that it is not used academically, it's just that it is used in a very different way. And actually, okay, I, I still got other examples, but I will just skip it to make it a little bit faster. So making sense of uh, our metrics, we notice that there's a positive correlation as is between our metrics and citation, particularly for Twitter and Mendeley. Yeah, there's other researchers who, who also done good studies that shows the positive correlation like what uh, Tawal has shared. Our metrics for more recent articles may be higher because of the increasing intake of the social web and because articles may be mentioned mainly when they are published. Frequency of tweets per article tend to be very high in the first five days and it taper off then so there's a recency biasness for social media type of metrics. And to capture a broader or different aspect of the research visibility compared to the uh, traditional citation counts, uh, people might read, they might use it, but they might not cite it. So we find that our metrics is a very good way because it, it captures different citation and it shouldn't be really be compared with uh, just traditional citations. What to do with our, our metrics? <coughs> do we still use our metrics? Uh, these are some of the questions we ask after our studies. Is our metrics just measuring hot topics? How accurate or comprehension, uh, comprehensive is the, our metrics data? And our answers, yes. Um, we are actually using it. It is important. Tweeting an article might help to increase your web of science citation for some subjects. It offers a more holistic approach. Uh, it changes in the searching behaviors and the sharing of research. And the interesting part is our metrics is gaining acceptance by more funding agencies and academic institutions. So if everybody um, is accepting our metrics, then this is a new way definitely that in NTU we want to look at it. So these are some examples of research funding looking at our metrics. Okay, so um, so we have um, so one of the studies done by Tao Wong in 2013 that shows the majority of social co consumption is from mainly due to tweet. So we also look at our data and see what is the major or metrics that is being mentioned. So these are the top ones in Twitter's. Facebook uh, news and blogs, and we noticed for uh, certain subject categories again, um, it is like Twitter seems to be more significant, and for certain area it is uh, less impactful. So this will be good information that we could share with our own researchers. Uh, this is another uh, example. This test is done by. Uh, yeah, this is Tawal's uh, examples on conversations and retweets. And they, they did a very uh, intense content analysis of the type of tweets sent by researchers for the five different uh, disciplines. And these studies conclude that researchers share more links than the average Twitter users. Uh, so 
you know, the immediate data after we see this is we should tell our professors to treat more often and share the research. Then um, how accurate is um, using of the twist? OK, there's this study from uh, Taylor. So Taylor actually also shows, so he gave one of the examples on the challenges of measuring social impact using our metrics. He gave a very interesting example that this paper is described as the foundation text of this uh, error that is caused by this computation uh, in um, measuring of the growth of debt. And so for that period when it was announced, there was a huge interest in it, so a lot of people tweak. But uh, if you look at the other citation, scoring is actually not uh, very high. So this actually has a huge impact, but it might not be a scholarly impact. Okay, so I have more examples. Uh, my slides will be available, so you can just take a look. So we also did some testing. This is one of our faculty. This is part of the data. Uh, I have few talked because I haven't got his permission that he wants to, to make it so clearly, but um, all the information is public. So we also noticed that when we track his Mendeley usage, uh, there's more correlation. He doesn't have very good high uh, tweets or, or metrics. So we also need to study like what kind of usage statistics will capture most of our, our researchers. And we do find uh, Mendeley seems to be uh, an EBSCO usage uh, statistics because we are also looking at ONX tools. So 100% of the articles cited in the Web of Science got Mendeley data, 80% of the articles cited in Web of Science got usage data, and then 20% of the articles have uh, got tweets. So there is some positive correlation. Uh, this was another study done by uh, Stefan uh, Mendeley. I will skip. So next steps, what will we do? We are bringing this, um, we want to get more faculty support to study their social impact. Uh, we have five case studies. We are looking for another four faculty. We are trying to look for different faculty to work with us. Uh, they are quite positive. They are happy because uh, it does show that there's some impact in other areas for the research. We want to market to the university research office and share how our metrics can be used to measure engagement. We are meeting them soon. Uh, we want to create awareness among our faculty so that they will know what tools they should start be they should start to use like blogs or Twitter or Mendeley to push out their, their research. So uh, yeah, that's my conclusion. OK, thank you. Great, thank you very much. So we, have, we have time for a couple of questions. Do we have any questions from the floor? Um, I have a question. Uh, so I think uh, you're the first librarian today to speak. Do, do you think uh, the library is a natural home for this kind of information and disseminating this information to researchers? Mm, yeah, I would think so, because uh, we are in a neutral form. I think if it comes from the research office, it looks like a appraisal kind of assessment. But this is more because we, as we study more and more about our metrics, we find it's also a good place to study trends where researchers can use it to monitor trends, look what is the hot areas that they could maybe publish or do their research on, and also look for other people who actually tweet or blog about them, then maybe these are the people they should collaborate. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Do you have a question here? Can I ask about um, sort of types of articles that may be put into the graph mesh? So the one you showed there, and I think you can see this as a bit more like a review kind of article, so it's probably something that can be more accessible to a broader audience mm. than stuff that has loads of points and stats and things like that. So I just wonder if, you, if anyone's looked at that kind of thing, so it might be about what, how, it, how it's written and whether it's really be complicated and whether it's kind of answering things that people have already been digesting. <laughs> okay, the, the, the question is whether, uh, do you think that other than, because the article is reviewed, it's more easily digestible, that's why it has a high uh, tweet or high on metrics. Is that, is that right? Uh, the nature of the article, it's not too complicated, it's not, not got 
Yeah. Uh, um, primarily, when we did the study, it, it seems so, especially for the very top uh, or metric scoring articles, the title usually sounds more newsy, and it seems to be more interesting. Uh, they, but there are also those very scientific ones, which, um, I mean, I don't understand when I read them. <laughs> I presume it's very academic, so uh, they might be sharing something very fundamental, which is used by other researchers, and this also tends to, to be has high on metrics balance. But I agree that new C1 may be get more yeah, forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lunchtime. <laughs>